Uh, we are going to have this class on the house church. So let me open up in a word of prayer and we'll hop right in. Father God, thank you so much again for the time and opportunity to be here. We do pray that you can fill us up with your word and with your spirit, God, and uh, help us to edify the congregation, God, to inspire the people in here, to convict us all, and help us to have a, a bigger and clearer picture of not only who you are, but who you want us to be and how you want us to take your kingdom to the rest of the world. We love you so much and we thank you for this time. In your son Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. 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 So, uh, you know, uh, last month we had a midweek all about being prepared for service, uh, which I got a little bit fiery and excited. That's how I'll explain uh, my demeanor last time. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, obviously, I think I am passionate about this church and the people in this church and the future of this church. Uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, I think quite obviously, I felt like uh, last month's lesson was necessary. Uh, and as we get into these other lessons, they're going to be far more, I believe, practical, though we are going to get into some uh, theoretical things as well. But uh, I have mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again. The small groups of the church are the lifeblood of the church. Uh, Paul Ramsey used to say all the time, uh, that we are not a church uh, with small groups. We are a church of small groups. Right. And, and what that means is uh, not much can happen from the pulpit, all right? Uh, and not much can happen just uh, with us as a large group. I mean, a lot can happen, but it, we, we're not going to be effective if we are not operating in smaller groups uh, really being able to take the message elsewhere, but also really being able to get in each other's lives, uh, have deep and intimate relationships, relationships where iron sharpens iron and, and uh, one man and one woman is sharpening another. We, we need that kind of close-knitness in this church. Um, and so if that is the case, uh, then that means the house church concept is going to become uh, very important. And it's why we want to have house church consistently. Why? And that's in order to train the church to be mission-minded and to train the church to be able to be church planters. Uh, I think one of the things that happened, we're going to get into this, is that uh, when we get used to coming here as a, as a large church, a lot of times we lose the skills of being able to be out there and build smaller churches. We lose the skill to be able to be out there and really make disciples and get into people's lives and practice hospitality. Uh, and so that's why we are shifting to this house church concept. And that is to teach us how to have the most effective small groups as possible. Now, a big question that I think we all uh, need to ask ourselves as we get into this, why in the world would we need to plant churches? And uh, I'm going to open it up. Uh, let, me, let me take uh, two or three. Let me just hear some feedback. Why, do, why, do you, why would you all say a church would need to plant churches? Anybody? Okay, so that's just a, it's a marker of health that a church is able to expand and plant other churches. All right, uh, a marker of health, a, a goal of health. Okay, anybody else? Uh, yeah, Justin. It's what we're called to do in order to seek and save the lost. Yeah, amen. Kale. Okay, it just, it makes logical sense. If you've got something that's so good, logically, we would need to be sharing it. Amen. I, I think all of those are fantastic answers. Uh, and, and, I, and I do think, right, as Christians and as we read the New Testament, and as we read the Bible and we see these kinds of things happening, we need to be asking ourselves these kinds of questions, right? Like the Bible should evolve us as Christians the more we engage with it. So, you know, don't just let questions like this come from the pulpit. Let questions like that come from your quiet times as well. Let questions like that come from your prayer times. Let questions like that come from your intimacy with God. And then spend some time really uh, seeking the answers to those prayers from God in the scriptures. Um, 
I personally used to think that planting churches was about ego. Uh, there was a time in my Christianity where I'm like, look, the ICLC already got churches all over the world. Like, why do we need to plant more churches, right? Is this, is this, is this just about staking our flag, you know, in, in as many places as possible just so that we can show people how awesome we are? Now, look, I was young and I was dumb and I was immature, but those were some serious thoughts that I had had. Um, and, and, and let me say this. The ICLC does, our movement of churches is all over the world. I mean, we're not called the International Churches of Christ for nothing, right? But I just, I want to focus on this and I want you to keep this in mind. It's not about planting churches in a geographical sense, though that is important. It's about planting churches in a generational sense. This is why churches always have to keep planting churches because the world changes right? Churches come and go. The old ICOC wanted to evangelize the world in one generation, and amen. But I believe that goal was too narrow. God's kingdom doesn't just plant churches in a geographical sense. It must plant churches in a generational sense, meaning the work we do must take into consideration the fact that a church planted 30 years ago might not still be around today. If one movement plants churches all over the world in a generation, who will plant them in the next generation? The work we do now must develop a church and a people that have our kids, our grandkids, and their children in mind. A church that is mission-minded and understands its role in the world can then train its people to carry on that mission indefinitely. It's never about ego, right? It's not about spreading the ICOC or the Cola Church or anything like that. It's, it's not about us. It's about God and his kingdom. It's about making sure that the flame never dies. Making sure that when the generation before us goes to sleep, that we will take the baton and carry the fire of the Holy Spirit into the years and the decades to come. And then we will teach our children to do the same thing. So as we talk about planting churches, I just, if you don't remember anything I just said or the complexity of it, remember, it's not about planting churches geographically, though that's a part of it. What we're doing is a generational mission. It's a generational focus. This is why the the mission never goes away. It's why Matthew 28 never goes away because this all ebbs and flows and we have to make sure that as evil and darkness swells, we continue to carry the light into the world to scatter that darkness. We have four quick points tonight. Barry is confident that we can get through this as he says very quickly. Um, With the two people that are up here, my faith is not as strong as Barry's faith, but we will see. So my, our, our first point tonight is a uh, big church, small church. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. This is a familiar story, but uh, Ronnie Rose taught me something very interesting about it uh, recently. In verse 11, Genesis, or sorry, Genesis uh, chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now the whole world had one language and and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, again, we know the story. And, and uh, I, again, I'm gonna ask a question. What 
was the problem with what these people were doing? That's the question I'm going to ask. What was, what was the problem? Okay, okay, Josh. Okay, they were too heavily invested in one specific area. Anybody else? Rock? They were doing it for themselves. They were doing it for themselves, right? That's where we see the ego here. Who else? Any other answers? Uh, yeah. Disobedience. Disobedience. What were they being disobedient to specifically? Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, we can stop there. That's, that, that's exactly right. One, the ego is the problem, right? Uh, but, but more than that, it was this desire to congregate and not go elsewhere, right? God's intent was that men would spread over the whole earth and share his image and glory and benevolence to all the corners of the world. But men were not comfortable with that idea. And they sought to stay huddled together and to build a kingdom that would glorify themselves rather than spread a kingdom that glorified God. Let me say that again. Men were not comfortable with the idea of spreading over the whole earth. They sought to stay huddled together and to build a kingdom that would glorify themselves rather than to spread a kingdom that would glorify God. So what did God do? He says, I'm not gonna let you guys do that. <laughs> and, and so he, he scatters them. And, and this, it doesn't say it was a punishment, but he scatters them as a way to getting them back to what they were originally intended to do. Now, Acts chapter two parallels the story of Babel, right? But it repairs what happened at Babel, right? In, in Babel, all of their language gets confused, but then that curse is broken in Acts chapter 2. Remember when the apostles stand up, it says they were speaking, and everyone, though they spoke different languages, could understand what was going on. But after that, one language is returned to them, and the people are then unified by Jesus even the early church falls into the same trap as Babel. Not necessarily in an ego sense. It never says that the early church was like, we want to glorify ourselves. They were legit disciples uh, and they were together uh, and they were doing big church, man. Jerusalem was popping, okay? That was, it was the, the early church was the first mega church, right? And it was awesome. And for years it was that way, but they fell into the same trap as Babel. They were huddled together in Jerusalem for several years when they should have been doing Matthew 28, Jesus's last words, right? Go into all the world, baptize every nation. They knew what the mission was, but what they had was so awesome. They were like, let us just, let us just chill here for a second. All right, this is, this is fantastic. This is amazing. This is incredible. And after a while, I don't know if they forgot the mission or not, but they were there enjoying themselves instead of going out and spreading the kingdom. And don't get me wrong, they were making disciples in Jerusalem and in that area, right? Disciples were being made, uh, but the kingdom was staying relatively in one place until what? Stephen gets stoned. And the part, not you, Stephen, and the persecution happens. And once again, God allows the church to be scattered. Now, what's the point here? We face the same temptation today, church. God has given us something incredible in this church and in the establishment of the church organization in general. God works and he moves and he builds us up and he grows us until we need buildings, right? And then we fill those buildings up so much that we have to get bigger buildings. Do you guys remember when we were on Divine Street? And, and the Sundays where we were there, we would have to add all those chairs in, the, in that middle aisle. And it was bursting at the seams to the point where we had to go and we had to be in hotels uh, at the embassy suites and other hotels. We had to do outdoor services because that church could no longer contain the growth that God was bringing to this congregation, right? So we had to move into a bigger building, right? 
But even, even after that, you know, we, we move into bigger buildings and, and, and it's awesome and we worship together and we come here on Sundays and we take communion and we get to fellowship and there are hundreds of people singing praises to God in one room and they are fellowshipping and there are smiles and laughter and there are children breaking things. It's incredible. It's an amazing time. But the temptation, the temptation is just to keep growing and swelling right here. God has built something so wonderful that we don't want to leave. And that's a good thing, church, that, that what we have is awesome. And, and before I go on, like th- th- these, are, these are my thoughts and, 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 and my opinions. Do you think what we have is awesome? I mean, do you, do you recognize you know, sometimes I can have complaints about, you know, the building. I can think it's not too pretty or, you know, it'd be cooler if this was that way or this was that way. Every time somebody comes from another church to visit, they say, oh my gosh, what you have here is incredible. We wish, we wish we had something like that, like this, back where we're from. God has given us so much And and I'm talking about us, right? I'm talking about Cola Church, the Columbia Church of Christ. This is is an incredible place. It's so awesome, we don't want to leave. Uh, And and that's how mega churches happen, right? We we get bigger and we we get bigger in one place and and the bigger you get, the more money you have and you start putting that money into the facility and into the worship and into the staff and and it becomes big and it becomes flashy and it becomes awesome and you have high budgets and, and, and you can actually put professional people. The only professional musician we have on this stage is Idris. Everybody else is volunteers. So if you got any complaints, just recognize we only have one professional up here, okay? Everybody else is doing it out of the goodness of their heart and at the limits of their voices. But, you know, everything gets big and, and, and it's awesome. And, and all, none of that stuff is bad. I'm not saying that mega churches are bad, um, especially if the aim is the development of people and the making of disciples so that the kingdom can spread. But after a while, the temptation of Babel comes upon us in two ways. And I just, I want you guys to keep these things in mind. We're, one, We love the bigness and we love the comfort and we love the security of big church so much that we don't want to leave. We want to stay here and make bigger and make this place bigger and better. And eventually our egos can get wrapped up in that. And before you know it, our church becomes about us and how big and awesome we are instead of about God. That is something that can happen. If it happened to the people at Babel, it can happen to us as well. The second temptation is that uh, whether that ego part happens or not, The other way we're tempted is in the way of complacency. Too many people in the pews means that there's not enough serving jobs in the church to put everybody to work. And we know that every part needs to do its work. The bigger and more huddled the church, the more difficult it is to develop people because people are developed through serving. And in the church, there aren't enough roles for all 200, 300 people to be serving, right? And so people end up coming just as spectators, not because their hearts are bad, not because they're sinful, right? Not because they're immature, but because there's literally nothing else to do on a Sunday morning, right? The ship they're on has become a cruise ship rather than a rowboat. But we love cruises. They're awesome. I've never been on a cruise. They're awesome. (laughs) Barry says they're awesome. Let me say this, God gives us big church so that we can develop people to go and make a bunch of little churches. That is the purpose of big church. If we don't recognize that that is the aim and the goal, then we'll fall into the temptation of Babel every single time. Now, I wanna give a little analogy here before I shift over to to Barry in the second point, but uh, just think about the concept of the family, okay? The nuclear family right? Uh, An established family is awesome, right? I think about, uh, you know, I shared this on Sunday about how my brother and I, we both got expensive game consoles in one Christmas, right? I think I was uh, a freshman in high school. In an established family, the parents are there, and guess what? The parents have money, right? 
And the kid, to the kid, everything is paid for, right? In the house, every mouth is fed. Everybody is clothed. They get their Xboxes and their PS2s. They have fun siblings. And life is good for many, many years, filled with love and care and filled with joy and fun and filled with safety and comfort. And that is awesome. Everybody loves to be a kid in a family. My kids have zero needs. They just run around all day enjoying themselves. And I get scared because I'm like, oh, no, they're going to start to think that life is all about just getting what they want. You know, I have to mature them out of that. But that's just the nature of kids being a part of a family, not just little kids, but like when you get to your middle school years, your high school years, right? And your parents have probably advanced in their careers and they have that money. That established family is great. Every church should aspire to be that established family. I don't know if you're following the analogy yet, but that's what a big church is. It's an established family that parents have the money and it's able to take care of all the kids and it's awesome. And you, you know, you take for granted the big house that you live in. Uh, you take for granted the fact that you can go out so, you know, so often and get takeout and, but you still get a whole bunch of home cooked meals and mom can cook and it's delicious and it's incredible. And you have no idea what you're in for once you leave the comfort and safety of that house. Big church. Uh, sorry, uh, the family, but that, but that status of the family exists only for a time, excuse me. After a while, the purpose of all that is to help the children to mature and grow so that they can go out into the world and make their own families. Big church is the established family. And then there's house church or small church. Small church or house church is the adventure. I'm going to emphasize that word. The adventure of building a young family. Now, this is also fun, but there's not as much money in that. The facilities or your house or your apartment is a lot smaller than what you remember growing up. You eat more takeout rather than deeply nutritional home-cooked meals. But you're together because you love each other. And that's what makes that stage awesome. It's an adventure and you might live in a sketchy part of town, but it's the love and relationships and the spending time together that's so fun. And then that love multiplies the family, right? Kids are born, right? Disciples are made. But it's still different from big church because the children are young and it's, uh, the situation becomes messy and it becomes unpredictable and they require a lot of time and a lot of attention. They require a lot of love and guidance and they require a lot of boundaries and discipline. This is a whole new kind of adventure, one that's going to take a lot of energy and a lot of lack of sleep, a lot of bearing with people and a lot of patience. And it's going to take even more love and even more deep relationship. Small church with all of those things, it then begins to grow and it grows. And after a while, it begins to look like big church. And then the cycle repeats itself. Again, this is how we spread the kingdom in a generational sense, not just in a geographical sense. This is how God designed human beings to work, how he designed us to take dominion of the world, to spread his care and love and goodness to the ends of the earth through the loving family unit that produces more and more images of God to take his glory everywhere. This is also how he designed the church to spread his care and love and goodness to the ends of the earth through loving family units that produced more and more images of God that take his glory to the ends of the earth. We've gotten good. Cola Church, the Columbia Church of Christ has gotten good at big church for decades. It's time for us to start sending some children out to start some families of their own. Amen? Barry's gonna do point number two. So, I know that there are some of you that Satan is talking to right this second. Okay. Because it happened to me. When I first saw his notes, I thought, so what does this mean? 
big church is bad and little church is good. And that's not what he just said. Um, big church is awesome and it does some fantastic stuff. And we need to keep being really good at it. It also has some problems that we need to overcome. Little church, house church, is fantastic. And it has some amazing strengths and some amazing opportunities for growth. It also has some problems that we need to be careful and that we need to stay away from. So they're both good and they're both bad. You need to do both of them well. And the key is, why in the world are we doing this? And the answer is, we're doing both of these things to glorify God. Amen. That's the key to it. Um, I, I want to define a term real fast. House church. What does it mean? Um, my son, who takes great delight in picking at me and, and uh, making fun of me, uh, when, when I talk to him about this lesson, uh, he says, well, dad, house church is sin. Everybody knows you can't have church unless you come to a church building. So <laughs> he doesn't really mean this. So um, I, I want to kind of throw it out there real fast. What does house church mean? Don't overthink it. Somebody raise your hand. What does house church mean? Yeah, having church in your house. So it's not this weird, strange, bizarre kind of thing. And real fast, I want to throw out some scriptures with you and tell you that historically, in the Bible, they did both. Historically, Acts 2, 42 through 47. Where's the church meet? Temple courts, that's right. Um, big church. They all met together in temple courts. Um, Acts 5, 12 through 16, where's church meet? All met together where? Say it again. Did he say something about Elvis? What? Nope. Solomon's colonnade, absolutely. Okay, so th th there's, there's a couple of different places where they're meeting big all together. Uh, when the church meets in Ephesus, where does it meet? Bear, you've been there. Where's it, where do they meet? Okay. That place as you're coming down the hill on the right. You can do it. The lecture hall of... Okay, yeah. It says Tyrannus in the Bible, but Tyrannus is, a, is an alliteration of Tiberius. So it's Tiberius Caesar's lecture hall. But... There's plenty of scripture references where they all meet big. Also, though, Acts 12, uh, verse 12 through 47, I'm sorry, through 17, Paul gets out of jail and he goes to a prayer meeting and it's in somebody's home. His house church. They're having a prayer meeting. They're all getting together to pray. They're in somebody's home. Uh, Romans 16, verse 3 through 5 um, Paul says, hey, and I want to also greet the church that meets in your house. Both things are in the Bible. They're both historically things we should be doing and things we should get good at. Big church and house church. And Pierce going to talk about how we're supposed to do that. Amen. <clears throat> Barry's sticking to it. Okay, Barry, I see you. I'm the, I'm the problem here. That's, that's, that's what I'm recognizing, guys. <laughs> uh, Romans 12. Uh, we read this last week. This is when I got really heated. And who knows? It might happen again, but that's the Holy Spirit. It's not me. Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment and according to the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us as one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all others. We have different gifts according to the grace uh, given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. 
Uh, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position, do not be Conceded. So what we have here is a scripture of a ton of practicals of how to do church in general well, but these practicals will go a long way when it comes to your small group and when it comes to house church. So I'm just going to rush to those, but let me just give a quick anecdote, you know, back to that family analogy. When a family becomes established and mature, and a lot of times what you'll see, I think sometimes, especially here maybe in America, is that sometimes children grow up. And then they stay in the house, right? And not always. Some of those children, they're awesome. You know, they're still doing the chores. Sometimes I'm convinced that my dad had multiple kids so that we could be the ones who cut the grass and did the dishes and clean the house, right? Uh, so some of these kids in their maturity, they still love their parents and they serve and they're there and, and, and they are a blessing to the household, right? And not a curse. But then there are some children, who I think, I'm not calling them this, the world may call them this, they become freeloaders, right? And they're sitting there on the couch eating potato chips, right? Specifically potato chips, wiping their grubby, nasty hands on their shirt. They got, they got oil stains on their clothes and they watching TV all the time. Always, not, not even, they ain't even got a job, right? They just, they just there and they are living off of the wealth in their mature state, living off the wealth of their parents. And that's, if that happens in the normal family, uh, that can also happen in the church. That can happen in the big established church, right? And I'm not calling anybody here freeloaders, but if the shoe fits, figure out if that's you or not here in this congregation, because every congregation is going to have some freeloaders. It's just, again, it's another part of the temptation that comes. And like I said in that first point, if you find yourself without a role, that doesn't mean you're a freeloader. It means that there are just too many people here to fulfill all the, you know, to fulfill the minute amount of roles that a large church is going to have. But that doesn't mean that we can't all be serving. And so as we think about serving and as we get into these practicals, just remember, whether you're in big church or small church, these things should be happening, right? Church, and, and we're going to talk about this, but like, these things are just what we should be doing as Christians right. with each other. Right. And uh, it's just a lot easier for everyone to be able to do them well in a smaller environment because there are more needs within a smaller uh, environment or rather more roles that can be filled. Uh, so I, I love how he starts this off. You know, he talks, goes through that you have all these gifts, but he starts off by just saying, love sincerely. Love must be sincere. And that goes into the whole concept. You need deep and real relationships. You need genuine discipling in your life. And, and let me, that word discipling, it doesn't mean you need to have someone in your life genuinely rebuking you all the time. Discipling shouldn't have a negative connotation. Discipling is just a relationship in which we help each other be better disciples. And is, is rebuking a part of that? Yes, but hopefully not all the time, right? This is encouragement. This is sharing scriptures. This is loving each other. This is, discipling is doing all of the things that we're about to do with each other, right? Having deep and intimate relationships. So we, we, we have to love sincerely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these practicals not necessarily with the verbiage that the scripture uses, but every practical I'm going to give comes right from the scripture. Next, we need to build deep convictions together. I love how he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, right? Amen. That is about conviction right there, right? Being people who have deep convictions. And, and, and I think a lot of times our convictions can be very personal, 
I know this is happening with, with the young people, with the younger generation, is that Christianity becomes much more about me rather than us. And so there's this whole concept of like, well, this is my personal conviction. It's like, well, look, how about you step out of your own personal life, right? And join the kingdom of God, right? That's, that, that's what this is about. Uh, and, and, and that concept, that individualistic concept was not a thing in this in this context and generation of people, they were a lot more communal than like the entire nation of America is founded upon independence, right? It's founded upon individuality. And amen, we get to be ourselves and that kind of stuff. But when we become Christians, guys, the we becomes far more important than the we. And the we needs to be strong and needs to be pure and needs to be righteous so that, yes, they can know God. But how do we know God? Well, we know that in Ephesians, it says that only by us being together can we begin to understand who God is and the depth of his love. We need to build deep convictions, not just on an individual basis, but on a collective basis right? Uh, and again, be thinking, house church, right? So um, with the leaders, we're going to go through a lot of these things. We're going to teach more specifically in our leaders meeting. Every leaders meeting this year, we're going to go through deeper practicals of how to do this and do it well. But we wanted to make sure we did this class and Sunday's leaders meeting before March 19 so that you have at least something to start doing uh, when we start uh, this month. But um, when I say something like you need to have sincere love and deep relationships, or you need to build deep convictions. We will give some practicals, but I want you to think through, okay, well, what does that look like? And what, what is that going to mean for you to build deep convictions together, right? And there's, there's, there's 10 other practicals that pop up from that. And I'm not going to go through tonight, but you know, that means sitting together and, and, and eating and, and, and digesting the Bible to figure out, uh, to find out what pleases the Lord, right? To find out what is good and what is bad and, and what we should be doing and how we should be. It's going to take a lot of conversations, a lot of time together and a lot of time in the word and in prayer and in, and in, in uh, consulting God and who he is. Next practical, be devoted to each other right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spread that to the four devotions, right, that we see in Acts chapter two, but be devoted to the word, be devoted to the fellowship, to communion, uh, and to prayer. And when I say communion, that means be there on a Sunday morning, right? And again, that's big church, small church. I don't care. I don't care the size of it. If you're devoted to the breaking of the bread, that means you're there when we are taking communion. That is a Sunday morning service, whether it's big or small. Be devoted. More than that, lift up one another. You know, I'm going to, I have an apology coming in one of my sermons, but uh, in, in uh, trying to grow in my craft and preaching and communicating to you all, I've learned that perhaps, as my wife tells me, uh, my lessons can have more of a negative slant. Now, I fought her hard on this. I'm like, don't you realize that the entire New Testament is Jesus and Paul rebuking the bejesus out of people who claim to be the people of God? She's like, you're insane. And I'm like, you're insane. We literally had that, that, that discussion. Uh, but I am, uh, what I do realize is that encouraging one another is also in the New Testament. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, right, to, to really be filling that into the way that I communicate and bear with me as I grow in that. Uh, but when it comes to an individual basis and when it comes to the small church, uh, when, when it comes to your small group, and sorry, let me say this as well. When I say something like house church or small church, I know what we can primarily come to mind is the concept of like what you're doing in your small group on that Sunday morning. Just use this whole concept to refer to your small group right? It's, it's, it's not just about the Sunday morning. It's your family group. That's who we're talking about tonight, right? And is this what your family group looks like? So when I say, uh, when the scriptures uh, tell us to lift one another up, be thinking to yourself, how often do you think about lifting up the others in your small group? Is it something you do consistently? Is it something that you're thinking about intentionally? This is what the Bible calls us to do. Uh, more than that, and I love this part, everyone has a job. If you don't know what your role is in your small group, go sit down with your group and say, hey guys, 
How can I serve? What can I do? We need to each be eager to serve in the ways that God has made you and called you to serve. And all of you have a gift. I don't know what it is, and you might not know what it is. And that's why I was shouting so much last month, because all of you have a gift. God has put all of you here for a very specific reason. And what that reason is, yet we might not yet know, but we will figure it out as we are on this adventure of young, you know, building a young family. Amen? Amen. More than that, be joyful as you go. Believing and hoping that God will bring growth. I think the scary thing about small church sometimes is that you can't hide anymore, right? Right? You can't just rely on the strength of an established family to bring the growth. It means that you just, you got to be a part of the moving thing now. You know, who's going to share their faith? You. <laughs> who's going to reach out? You. Who's going to preach? You. Right? It's, it's, it's now on us. And when it comes to the growth, we can get very afraid like, oh no, can this small group really do it? Can we really make disciples? Is that something that we're actually capable? And look, Yes. Well, actually, no, you're not capable of it. The Holy Spirit is. And each and every one of you have the Holy Spirit. Be joyful and believe that God will bring the growth. And he will if you guys and if we plant and we water. Uh, more than that, be patient as suffering comes, right? I'm not going to go into too much detail, but guys, it is harder as a small church, right? You don't have all the parameters. You don't have all the money. You don't have all. And so sometimes it's going to, sometimes the worship is going to feel like suffering. Okay. Not everybody got the voices. Not everybody can hit the notes. Y'all struggling in there. You got a visitor and you know, it don't sound good. And you just thinking, God, please let the preaching fix this. And then the preacher starts and that ain't good either. And you're like, God, please. Let the Holy Spirit make the difference here, right? A lot of times, even the function of small church is going to feel like suffering. But then even outside of that, there, some serious things might happen, right? We might go through some stuff. It, it's going to be hard or, or it's not going to be easy, right? Recognize that's a part of the process, right? And it's only there to remind you that you are legit disciples that don't fold under pressure. And it's there to help you to mature. Pray always. Prioritize unity, strive for humility, and strive to reach everyone. Practice hospitality. We've built that into the identity of who we are as a church. We should be very good at that now. It's been a year and a half. Have the concept in your mind, you don't attend house church, you are the house church, right? It's not somewhere you go, it's who you are, right? Uh, and then Bear, Barry's gonna share a few things to close out this point, and then he's gonna close us out uh, with the final point. Thanks, Barry. All right. I think one of the most important things about this how do we do small group, how do we do house church thing is the why. Why in the world are we doing this in the first place? Why do I even come to church? I asked Barry, I said, um, again, he, he constantly picks at me. I said, so, uh, you know, how are we supposed to be doing, uh, you know, house church? What do you think? And he says, well, we should all do it from our houses so we can all do it on computers and I can wear my stretchy pants. Okay. And... <laughs> and I, 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 I thought to myself, okay, um, one kind of thought piece that I want to want to give you is the idea of a, a lot of what God calls us to do is not necessarily to be professional or be polished or to be, uh, you know particularly even necessarily terribly experienced in a lot of stuff, it's to show up um, as especially in house church. A lot of it is just being there. Yep. Um, there and, and, and here's the deal. I could say to you, 
You are commanded to do this. Okay, I could do that. I could kind of play the Apostle John card and we could say, hey, look, we're going to do nonstop quiet times on the book of First John and, and the, the love of God, my love of God and my love for my brothers is inextricably linked. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all that. Read the book of First John yourself. But it, these things are, they're one I can't say that I love God if I'm not really having a love that actually is an active thing with my brothers and sisters. I just can't. Um, I could talk about, I command you not to give up meeting together. And we could do the whole Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 23 through 25 thing, where it, it's interesting that that the guy who wrote Hebrews puts intention in as opposites, a binary logic of encourage brothers and sisters versus give up meeting together. That these two things are opposites of each other. If I give up meeting together, it's the opposite of encouraging people. If I encourage my brothers and sisters, it's the opposite of giving up meeting together. Um, church is not about you. Church is about me. <laughs> church is not about you. It's how you're supposed to be encouraging the people around you. Yeah. Church is not about you. It's how you're supposed to be worshiping God and living out the scriptures. It's one of the commands. So I know you guys are probably not the target audience for this idea. So here's what I want you to do for me. Take a big look around. Go ahead. I want you to identify somebody who you love that you think to yourself, man, I wish they were here tonight. And call them. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you write notes, write their name down. And call them. <laughs> Jesus is, is good. He's here though. All right. <laughs> but but I, 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 I want you to think about somebody from your family group, somebody from your house church that's not here and call them. And when you call them, this is what I want you to say. Brother, sister, I need you. I need you. It would really encourage me. It would really help me if you were there. I need you in order to be my best for God. Yeah. I need you in order to live out the scriptures and for us to really love each other like the Bible commands us to do. I need you. So you should have at least one person's name on your paper right now, at least. And go ahead and let's let's take this one out into the rest of the congregation. Yeah. Um, second thought I had about the how do we do this whole small group thing? How we put this into practice? And I'm going to tell a couple of parables. All living things, the way that they grow, is they're all made out of small cells, whether you are animals, plants, fungi, all living things are made out of little cells. And to grow, they reproduce themselves and they separate into two cells. And now they're twice as big. And those little cells separate and reproduce themselves into two more cells. So now we have four. And that, 
all living things grow like this. All of them. House churches, if they are living things, should be doing this as well. Um, I also will, before I give you a couple of scriptures about this, I also want to tell another parable. Um, stars are supposed to give out light and heat. All life on our planet, unless you live in the bottom of one of the very, very deep sea trenches and have a metabolism that's based on sulfur, Unless, unless that's you, all living things on the planet are powered by the light and heat of our star, the light and heat of our sun. The sun's fuel is, is it, the thing that makes it work is gravity. It needs a certain amount of mass. It needs a certain amount of, of stuff there in order to do what it needs to do, in order for it to shine, in order for it to give off the energy that it needs, it needs a little bit of critical mass. But if you add too much mass, if you keep adding and adding and adding and adding and adding, ultimately, it gets into this great big thing that then, under its own weight, collapses. We call that a black hole. In the same way, house churches are like this. They need some critical mass. They need you. They need these people that you're going to call on the phone tomorrow. They need a certain amount. We, we need a certain amount of, of us to show up, to be able to generate the kind of energy and light that we're supposed to, that we're supposed to generate. You are commanded by God to shine for Jesus in Philippians 2. You're, the, Jesus says, you're the light of the world. If we have family groups, though, or house churches that get too big, they collapse under their own weight. They have so much, it takes so much energy to do anything that they can't get anything done. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know that some of you are possibly in some of those kinds of groups. This is not, I don't think this was intentionally done in any kind of badness. It's because, hey, we love each other and we love kind of sticking together and staying together. It's kind of this Babel concept that Perry was talking about at the beginning. But ultimately, if we're going to be healthy, we need to be this growing cell that separates and divides and builds more cells so that we can, so that we can be who we need to be for Jesus. Yep. So I want to give you two scriptures. First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 through chapter 11, verse 1. Somebody quote it for me. I'll give you a hint. The, the key word for it is example. Follow my example as I follow examples. That's right. Follow my example. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. Somebody quote it for me. Come on, Stephen, you got this one. You got it. What you've seen or heard me entrust to... Reliable men who are qualified to do what? Teach others. Teach others. So here's the deal. In order for us to be the kind of stars, the kind of people who shine for Jesus and are the light of the world, and in order for us to be the kind of living house churches that grow and fill the space and, and provide amazing opportunities for people to know Jesus and to live for Jesus. You, yeah, you, you need to be walking with somebody and learning how to do what they do. 
you need to be entrusting to reliable men or women what you know so that we can keep this thing going. The key to these cells separating and dividing is that each one of them is healthy because they've got what they need. So, in your small group, in your house church, hopefully there's somebody who is an amazing hospitality person. Go figure out how to help them. Go figure out how to be like them. Some of you guys need to learn how to cook. Come on. Some of you guys need to learn how to, how to have, and maybe an older woman teach you how to make something. Um, go learn from somebody how to do some hospitality stuff. Some of your house churches, some of your groups have some amazing organizers. Go sit with them. Learn how to do that. Hey, the next time you plan something, can I, can I be in on that? I'd like to learn how to plan like you plan. I'd like to learn how to organize things like you do it. Some of your groups have amazing servants. Um, people that you know you can count on that are just there all the time helping other people. Go figure out how to walk with them. I, I don't care what it is. God does not care what it is that's your talent. He just wants you to use it. Go find somebody to walk with with the idea that one of these days, I'm going to be like you. Um, Scott uh, works in the church building. He kind of, he does all the behind the scenes things that are amazing that keep things running and he does a beautiful job and, and he's an awesome servant. One of the things I love about him though is this year he's brought on board Mike Loman to come work with him. And, he, and he's already said, hey, one of these days, I'm not going to be around, and I need to train a replacement. Yep. So find a replacement. If there's somebody, you're not going to be around forever. Right. Find a replacement. One of these days, our group's going to need to split, and we're going to need to have awesome servants in two places. And we're going to need to have fantastic, hospitable people in two places. And we're going to need to have amazing organizers in two places. Go walk with somebody. If you're somebody that's good at some of this stuff, find somebody to uh, put your arm around their shoulder and say, hey, I want you to come learn from me. I want to teach you how to do what I do. And when they say, oh, no, I can't possibly do this. Yeah, you can. You, you can do it. We have a really weird sometimes idea, especially of what leadership means. Um, I'll tell you uh, a funny story. I'm trying to look to see if he's here. Um, I was talking to this guy and he was saying, hey, yeah, you know, I, I want to try to help out this ministry and uh, I want to try to help organize it. And I want to try to help uh, um, communicate and getting the message out about things. And I want to uh, try to work with some of the people in it and plan stuff and, and, and help get things moving and follow up with people and really love up on people in this ministry because I really have passion for it and I really believe in it. But I don't want to be a leader. I was like, well, what do you think leadership is? I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. These things can look a whole lot different. They, you don't have to look exactly like Perry. You don't have to look exactly like me. You don't have to look exactly like Nikki. To be an amazing servant for God and used in amazing ways, um, I, I think, frankly, you'd find that you kind of like some of this stuff. 
I, I again, we, Barry and I were talking. I, I've never had more fun than working for God's kingdom. Never. Even on a cruise. So, <laughs> so figure out how to walk with somebody. Yeah. Figure out how to go dream some dreams and do something amazing. Yeah. Um, at the end, I, I, I want to do this. First of all, today's the second. First. Today's the first. Okay. We'll give you till tomorrow. Mm. Tomorrow is the second of March. It's actually a palindrome, three, two, two, three. Okay? Same forwards and backwards. All right. And tomorrow, officially, every one of you is now on a mission team. Go ahead, kind of embrace that one. Think about that. You are officially on a mission team. Your house church is officially on a mission team. One day when you go to plant a church somewhere, you'll think to yourself, well, this is not really any different than what I've already been doing. Because right. I've already been on a mission team. I was just on a mission team for my neighborhood or a, a mission team at USC's campus or a mission team, I, I don't care where it is. Um, you're all on a mission team. Yep. Full-time missionaries that work probably 50 or 60 hours a week part-time for some other venture. You're self-supporting mission team people. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. Pray about that. If that freaks you out, come talk to Matt. Um, <laughs> go talk to Matt. Go talk to Dwight. They're much wiser than I am. But you are officially on a mission team. God actually put you on a mission team when you said Jesus was Lord in the first place. But we're, we're trying to kind of change the mindset of what does it mean to be on a mission team? Well, it's what we're supposed to be doing all the time. Yep. Another thing I want to kind of telegraph to you is, is this. Right now, your mission team is whatever house church you're in now. Okay? Now, we're praying about this, and you've heard Perry kind of allude to this a little bit. We're praying about this, and we're probably, unless God says something different, we're probably going to tweak this a little bit in a way that I think is going to be a lot of fun for you, in that we're going to tweak some of these house churches to be a little bit more vertically mixed, where you may have some older people in your house church, and you may have some younger people in your house church. You may have some singles in your house church. You may even have some campus students in your house church. Um, you're going to have the opportunity to build some really beautiful relationships. And you're going to have the opportunity to look like it would be if you were sent on a church planning to Florence, South Carolina. Yeah. That's the way your house church is going to look. So one of these days when maybe you decide, you know, I'm going to move to Orangeburg, South Carolina, and I'm going to be on a mission team there, it won't look any different than what you're about to do, which is going to be fun. Yeah. Now, this does not mean that you are not allowed to be friends with the people that you're with right now. I'm going to say that again. This does not mean that you are not allowed to be friends with the people that you're friends with right now. Some of those people may be in your house church. Some of them may not. But raise your hand, everybody who thinks I have way too many friends. Anybody? Okay. You need to go talk to Mike, Matt, or Dwight afterwards too. <laughs> I, I don't have too many friends. Everybody who thinks, man, I get way too many people who are trying to help me be more like Jesus. No. Way too many people who are trying to help me be my best for God. No. You're going to have the opportunity to connect with a whole bunch of different kinds of people and still maintain all the friendships and relationships with people that you have now. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, 
because we're going to do this house church thing and we're going to go and do what the scriptures say. And we're going to be missionaries for Columbia, South Carolina and in our area. And sooner or later to the ends of the earth. So I think at this point, do you want me to pray and be done or let's pray. God, thank you so much for the way you love us. God, thank you so much for the way that you provide for us. God, thank you so very, very much for giving us your kingdom and your people and your church. God, thank you so much for giving us just all the amazing ways that you provide for us to grow, to get strong, to, to learn, and to and to put things into practice. And God, I pray that you will give us all the heart of a servant. God, I pray that you will give us all just a heart of love for our brothers and sisters. God, I pray that you will give us all a heart of love for the lost, God. God, make us great friends. Friends with each other, friends with the world, and most of all, friends with you. God, we love you so much. God, help us to do big church. And also, God, help us to do house church really, really well to your glory. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.